Hello, welcome to the uh, next installment of the Dutch landscape. Today we will be discussing Sealand, and after we discussed Sealand, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the crazy hybrid that is West Frisia, where I live, where, well, our daily third year students live. But first, Sealand. Sealand is located in the utmost southwest of the Netherlands. And this is a map of Sealand made by Ortelius in 1588. As you can see, Sealand does its name credit. It is mostly sea and some land. Now these are all islands, as you can see, and they look very different today. Um, what Ortelius also did is he made sure that we saw what the provinces were um, of the Netherlands back then. This is Northern Brabant. This is Flanders, Belgium, um, which is now part of the Netherlands, uh, Zeus Flandre. Um, and these are the islands of Zealand, and then over here there is uh, Holland. And I want you to take a good look at this map and then compare it to the next one and then compare it to the next one as we'll take roughly 100 years intervals between the maps. So this is 1588 and the next map is by Johan Blau, 1664, let's say 80 years later. And what Johan Blau did is um, he also drew gray areas around the islands also over here also over there and those are all areas that fall dry when the tide is low and flood when the tide is high as we've seen in the in the north of the netherlands in the in the Vodage, this sealand area is very much an area where we have a dry tidal marshes and Johan Blau had a beautiful keen eye for these kinds of details over there. Notice that the island over here for example is connected where it is over here still connected but a lot, a lot larger now. Notice that the island over here doesn't exist yet. There is an island here and an island there and there is some, some sort of a peninsula over here and over here all of this falls dry during the t low tide. This falls dry during the low tide. As you can see these islands are slowly growing together. Now Hen uh, Hendrik de Let in 1740 he drew again a map of uh, Comitatus Zeelandiae and Zuid-Beveland over here and Walcheren over there and North beveland over here are already a lot closer together than they were. There is a keen area of sea over here in Artelius's map. Over here there's still some sea but it's very close together already. Notice how North beveland is growing. And over here North beveland is big. There's still some sort of an island over here. And over here it's almost South beveland and, and Walcheren are already almost connected. South Beveland is already almost connected to North Brabant over here and Schouwen and Duiveland which are two distinct islands over here and over there with water in between. The water here is silting up and over here they are connected only separated by a uh, administrative boundary between Schouwen and Duiveland. Now over here Schouwen and Duiveland are connected Kure and Overflake which are which is an island in the south of the Netherlands. Kure over here, Overflake over there. Kure uh, over here, Overflake over there. They have grown all the way together into Kure Overflake which is uh, an island of uh, Holland, South Holland. This is already almost connected in the map of Lieutenant Arangoni in 1836, so another hundred years later. And this is the map by Burgers, 
1929, and it clearly shows that these islands have formed units that are a, bit, a, a lot bigger, even though North Beveland, South Beveland, and Volga are not connected as they are today. Uh, Tole has grown uh, towards North Brabant, and these islands are now um, scaled up. They have become bigger. And in order to understand what's going on, all you have to do is go back to the lecture on the north of the Netherlands and see how these people stole money from the sea by uh, deliberately placing fences in the, in the uh, Vodage where the deposition of sediments was accelerated uh, in a deliberate way. And so the Quelders became higher, the tidal marshes became higher, and then eventually you put a dike around it and you have gained some land. Now this process is known as accretion. Land accretion took place in the north of the Netherlands, but also in Zeeland. As these maps, if you just compare maps from 1588 to 1929, clearly, clearly shows. So, Zeeland has been taking up land from the sea, but it comes at a price. Obviously, everybody who lives in the Netherlands has seen pictures of 1953 uh, this was a huge, huge um, flooding of especially Zealand, but also in uh, Holland, South Holland. And the dikes broke through. We all know the story. By the way, this flooding event took place in more countries than just the Netherlands. The southwest of England and uh, Belgium also had to deal with a lot of losses. But um, these, these pictures are, have become very famous. And, um, you know, dead cattle everywhere. Um, just destruction on a massive scale in cities uh, as, you know, people tried to, when they came back to, to the islands, um, they just saw a massive devastation. Now, I've looked up some of these numbers. Uh, 200 thousand hectares of land were flooded. You can see that in this map of Zealand, especially um, Schouwe Duiveland and Goere Overflakke and the, uh, the, I think this is the Haring Fleet, then the, the Biesbos. Uh, th these were areas that Tole as well, completely flooded, completely flooded with water. 1,836 people died. Tens of thousands of animals died, as we just saw in this picture, and 100,000 people lost their homes, became homeless. So, Zeeland in 1953 was a major event in, in Dutch history where um, basically there was enough political um, 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 It became a sort of a political issue to never have this thing happen again in the Netherlands. We've, we've seen this before in 1916 when large parts of northern Holland were flooded and uh, the diking of the Southern Sea and the, 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 the danger that was the, the Zuider Zee was, was enclosed through in, in 1932 with the offslide dike. And now a similar plan to just keep the sea out of this vulnerable part of the Netherlands was uh, invented even uh, even though this was not a new thing it was an historical occurrence many um, um, villages just drowned in the ocean over the years now this is a, a, a map that I like to show of drowned church villages in Zealand and as you can tell all of the black ones with a number, so number 36, number 114, 44, 30, uh, 31, number 1, etc., those are all disappeared by a natural disaster. They, all the villages in, in, in dark black have been flooded away and been taken by the sea. So the sea has played a major role, a major role in this area of the Netherlands. And here you can see um, a, a quelder, a tidal marsh, and it is known as the, the drowned land of Saftingen. It's located over here, 
And it's just where the sea came in and basically just ransacked a piece of the, the, the land over there. And it became known as drowned land. The idea of drowned land and drowned villages is a very real thing in the southwest of the Netherlands still, even though we haven't seen this 1953 disaster type again. So just trying to, to paint a historical context here for, for the Delta works, um, which we'll get to in a second, but the, the real reason why these sorts of disasters happen in the southwest of the Netherlands is that these types of river mouths, because we are dealing with the Westerschelde and the Easterschelde, um, are known as an estuary. There's two types of river mouths in the world. There is river mouths such like deltas, uh, where a river comes out into the ocean. The current of the ocean water is very uh, slow, and it drops its sediment as the water flow slows down and builds up effectively new land because the sediment is not washed away by ocean uh, currents. Now, an estuary, sorry, an estuary is different. And in an estuary, uh, the current of the seawater is very, very high, and therefore sediments do not get flushed. Uh, sorry, get flushed away, and no new land is formed. And because of erosion, sediment that is dropped by the river. Um, uh, inside the flow of the river and the tides sort of press it around these these river banks these these estuaries become ever wider and wider now this map shows you this is Antwerp this is the harbor of Antwerp this is the Skeld and it flows into the river uh, sorry into the sea and over here we have the estuary system over here now notice that in the old maps that we've seen The estuaries were connected. This is the Westerskeld. This is the Eastern Skeld that has slowly been silted up. Over here, it's even clearer that the river comes in, Westerskeld, Eastern and over here, the Rhine, Meuse, Meuse, whatever, flow out into the, the North Sea as well. So we are used to thinking of the Netherlands as being a delta. And it is, as we've seen in the pre-glacial period, many rivers flowed here and dropped their sediments. But I, I think he could make a pretty good case to see to say that this is not a delta of the Skeld, but these are in fact estuaries. And another reason for this is that in an estuary, you have a lot more um, erosion of the banks and water gets pushed into this these kinds of funnels every time there is an there is a, a flood um, and so you have a, a lot of water over here and it's being pushed into this funnel there's nowhere else for the water to go up right now over here you see exactly the same phenomenon this is the North Sea basin if the if there is a every time it's flood water comes in and goes out Every time there's a flood here, water comes in, turns around, and goes away. Now, this area of the North Sea is a lot uh, narrower than this area of the North Sea. So, one meter of flood water that goes over here gets pushed up against England, Belgium, and the Netherlands and reaches altitudes of three meters, which is why over here uh, the tides are one and a half meters apart where over here the tides can easily be two and a half meters apart so flood being two meters higher than the ebb or two and a half meters so the north sea is more sh uh, sh narrow and it's even narrower inside the estuary okay so there's greater tidal currents there's more impoundment of water during northwestern storms especially if the wind comes from this area takes up the takes up the, uh, the, the the normal tide and even pushes up that higher and higher and not much sediments um, is 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 put in this ocean as it's being f uh, sort of flushed away by by strong currents in the North Sea there is a narrow strip of dunes because there's not so much sediment and you have 
1953, an old weak levy system which weren't properly maintained, and there was also a leap tide, so that's why 1953 occurred. It was a terrible disaster where um, um, nature, in terms of leap tide, a northwestern storm, and the, sh the general shape of the basin over here, made for a, for a large threat, and then combined with a, a old weak levy system that wasn't properly maintained, made made the system collapse and you know m many people were were victimized in, in that occurrence so here we are finally in our story at the delta works these huge sluices and dams were put down in front of the uh, 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 the water and completely cut out the eastern skeld which is now basically uh, 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 not a sea anymore or even though some salt water can come in and out and they, they just you know, cut 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 through here, cut off the eastern scales, cut through here, cut through there, and so you have these these huge large dams protecting the the the, the vulnerable dikes over here, and and over there, etc. So why didn't by the way why didn't they also dam this off? Well, then our Belgian neighbors in Antwerp, which is this third largest harbor in Western Europe after Rotterdam and Hamburg, they would probably get really upset with us if no ships can come in here anyway, anymore. Okay, um, so in, in short, the sea taketh away lives, church villages, drowned land, etc. This is a concept that is known to every Dutch person, especially if you live in the lowlands, especially if you live in Zealand. So for as long as people have lived on the islands of the Scouts estuary, the sea has mostly been considered an enemy of the people. But the sea also made Zealand very wealthy, um, especially during the Middle Ages and the Golden Age of the Netherlands. Fish, salt, trade and land were, were won by the sea. And to zoom in on this, this accretion, this, this land winning of Zealand in a little more depth, we need to understand this. Now, I already told you about land accretion earlier uh, in the lecture of the north of the Netherlands. Okay, it's similar to what we've seen in the north. And I've already pointed out that our t uh, this was Blau. Um, he already sort of mentioned in, in great detail all the schoren en slikken in the north of the Netherlands. We tend to speak about watplaten. Um, mud flats and over here in New Zealand those same names are um, they have different words for it schoren and slikken slikken the the really really clay muddy types of of mud flats and schoren the more sandy um, pretty nicely walkable um, area of the mud flats so in second grade, we've been to Terschelling and we've discussed the difference between uh, the Wantai and the sandbanks. And a slick would be the Wantai, where the water is uh, 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 standing still for the longest time. Clays, they trickle down and it's, it's mostly mud and um, clayish mud. And the Schorre, they, that, that would be the uh, sandbanks. So... Basically, what they did is you just put a dike around the coastal marsh and then it becomes good land for agriculture, which is why if you travel through Zealand, you see these kinds of things, land on the one hand, land on the other hand, and a dike in the middle. And some people, if you don't know this story, you're like, what is that dike doing there? Well, it's an old dike. There was At one time, there was ocean on this side and there was a, there was a dike here and there was land on the other side. And the ocean that would uh, go on with deposition, you know, the story that we've seen in Friesland as well. Uh, and eventually a new dike was built around it and they had won some more lands. Now this dike, they, they left that one in, uh, in the island as a sleeper dike. Now what's a sleeper dike? Well, if your main water um, barrier, your, your, your main dike, if that one breaks... 
then it's awesome if you have like a secondary dike protecting these houses, right? These houses are protected twice. Once by the, the big main dike over there and a second time over here. So if there's a hole here and this bit floods, then there is still this dike protecting these houses. So in some cases, in um, Zealand especially, just like we've seen in the north of the Netherlands, if you, come, if you drive around, you can sometimes see these sleeper dikes uh, where there is land on two sides and you're like, what? Why is that? Well, sleeper dikes. Now, another thing is uh, that you have different types of polders. There's old polders. On, in our example last time, this is an older polder than this one because this at one time was still ocean when this dike was built. And that is known as old land. Now, I, I, I take this example from uh, the beast bosses over here, and so uh, the Hollands Deep is here, and then Haringfleet, and then this all of this is Zealand, Oude Tonge, uh, over there, the, the village that suffered the most during the 1953 flood. And so this is, um, to be completely fair, uh, North Brabant. But it's th the same principle is very visible in this map. Now notice that Plundert is over here, Willemstad is over there, um, and this area between sort of the highways is a patchwork of old and new polders. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Plundert is over here, and then the oldest polder is the Oude Feinart polder over here where Feinart is built. There's also the Oude Appelaar polder, and um, the Juffrouwen polder, and the Elisabeth polder. And then there are a couple of new polders, which are usually a bit bigger and farther away, uh, for example, the Volkerak polder over here. Uh, this is also an old one, by the way. This one is pretty new. This one is pretty new. This one is pretty new. So the, the oldest villages here are this one and that one. And these are the, these, these are the old ones. And then new polders were won by the, by the ocean, pushing away the Hollands Deep in this direction and pushing away... Um, the uh, the Volkerak in this direction. Wow, that's many times. Okay, next one. Now, we're going to focus on this old land and new land business. This is an altitude map of uh, Zeeland. And blue represents the lowest areas and the, the more orange it gets, the higher the area gets. Now, in some cases, these maps, they also show you, uh, for example, Middelburg being very high. And this is because Middelburg has a lot of houses. And so there's a particularly large building over here. So um, these are, of course, the dunes. As you can see, it's a very narrow strip of dunes because not a lot of sand is allowed to, you know, s sediment here. Uh, and is being flushed away in this direction. And um, a very narrow strip of, of, of land, some large buildings over there, but in, in the most case, you can clearly see that the, especially over here on Walcheren, the areas furthest away from the sea, as we've seen in the north of the Netherlands, they're also the lowest. Okay? So where's the land lowest? It's furthest away from the sea. The, the closer you get to the sea, the higher it gets. Where's the land highest? Well, in the dunes. Why does this make perfect sense? Well, these islands are uh, land accreted areas. So this is, an, this is an old polar, then deposition continued, and so this is higher. Deposition continued, and so this is higher again. These are the new lands polders, which are higher because deposition continued for a longer time. Okay. Um, there, is, there is one thing that's really interesting if we have a look at especially Volgere. I have a close-up with another a legend. So again, the bluer it is, the lower. The more orange it is, these are the dunes. The higher it is, this is a dike, okay, and Vlissingen is orange, and Middelburg is orange, and all of this is very orange because there are large buildings there. 
But let's focus on the old land boulder that we see over here. Now there's something crazy going on. Throughout Walcheren, there are clear, higher areas. Now in some cases, for example this one, those are roads on dikes. In some cases, here, that's not the case. What I've done is now, um, first thing, first I must tell you this. The legend between this one and this one, of course, is not the same. So when I talk about differences in altitude, I'm not talking about hundreds of meters. This is, in fact, not that much higher. I thought I had a um, um, cross section, but I don't. How much higher is this? Well, it's roughly around one meter higher. And how do we get these sort of one meter high altitude differences in the old, in the middle of the old land polders of uh, Zealand? The answer here is relief inversion. What's really have inversion? Okay. We have seen these pictures of creek ridge system of of creek systems. For example, in the Verdronkeland um, van Saftingen, very clear. There's a difference between these areas, which are mostly clays, and these super low areas that are known as tidal creeks. Every time there is a, a huge flood. Water will come in through these creeks, water will rise and eventually flood this. The further away you are from these creeks, the higher the clay content. The creek itself is a mixture of clays and sands because water flows here quicker than it flows over there. So it can keep in more sand. All right, a little more sand in the creeks than in the area around it. So if I draw a cross section of, for example, this, I have during the time of the formation of the land this situation. This is the creek that we just saw. The mean low water is over here. So if there's low water only over here, there's still some water flowing through. The mean high water, so the average altitude of the high tide, is over there. But if there is an extreme high water, like a storm or leap tide, then it will fill up entirely with water and it will go over here. Now, as we've seen in the river landscape, exactly the same thing happens. Every time there is a flood of the river, or in this time, in this case, the creek, the largest sediment is being deposited over here and over there. And the further you go away from the creek, the clays filter out and are being deposited over here. So after a lot of these extreme high water events, a lot of sand is over here and over there. As we've seen in the river landscape, these creeks, they are especially the beddings and the, uh, the levees, the natural levees around it are mostly going to be sand or a mixture of sand and clays. The, the clays are deposited furthest away. So what happens if after a long time you start to pump out a lot of water, the land consolidates and relief inversion takes place just like we've seen in the peat landscapes. Clays have a larger volume of water and will shrink more than the sands, which has a, a, a lesser concentration of water and will shrink less. So in this situation, this is the lowest area. It fills up with sand. And after the consolidation of the uh, clays, the sand areas will consolidate less and become higher. So everything you see here are creek ridges, elevations of about one meter higher than the surrounding lands. Kommen 
Uverwalle. Just like we've seen in the river landscape. Except that this was, of course, a tidal marshy area at one point. This is known as relief inversion, or relief inversion, and creek, riv, creek, creek ridge inversion. Pardon my French. So, very short, the bullet points. Clay and peat hold much more water. Sand holds little water. When an area with a relative amount of sand, a former creek, or a, uh, a former river, when that consolidates, the sand consolidates less than the clays and peats around it. And so a sandy ridge between one and two meters high is formed in the land. What once was low, now is high. An inversion of relief. Okay, the main points to take from Zealand. Old land is lower than new land because it was diked first and therefore has received less deposition of sediment. If these areas in Zealand can be viewed as bathtubs, if you break this dike, the tub will fill with water, which is the reason why so much, uh, sorry, so much of Friesland, uh, Zealand, eh, was filled up with water, okay? These areas, the oldest islands, were also the lowest because they were diked first. So if you break the dike, this is a bathtub that will fill up with water. Which is why so much damage was done in 1953. And which is why we've built the dams to protect us from it. Zealand essentially is islands that are bathtubs full of water. Now these bathtubs are extremely vulnerable to flooding. See the Verdronken Land van Safting. It's very easy for the sea to reclaim land that was won after 1,000 years, or, or sorry, 100 years of, of um, land accretion. And there are sleeper dikes in the land of Zealand where new tidal marshes were accreted from the sea. And some areas are slightly higher than others because of creek ridge inversion, especially on Walcheren. So that's Zealand. Now we switch to West Frisia. I live over here in Enkhuizen. This is the IJsselmeer, the former Southern Sea. This is the North Sea. And West Friesland is a regional entity sort of built around the West Frisian Umring Dyke over here. Goes through Auto Lake. Now, one of my favorite things to do in summer is to take my bike and start riding the West Frisian Umring Dyke for, for a time. I lived over there. And um, now I live in the suburbs. Uh, okay, so I go over here and I, I cycle my bike. And the Westfriesian Umring Dyke is, the route is, I think, 130 kilometers long or so. And when it's beautiful weather and there's not too much wind, I, I like to cycle around Westfriesland. And so um, this regional entity is a crazy hybrid of everything that we've seen. I'll tell you why. If you study the names of all these places, these little villages in West Friesland, you'll notice that a lot of them have the same suffixes. Wout, 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 Wout. Broek, Broek, Dijk, Dijk, uh, uh, Horn, Dijk, Horn itself, the sort of capital of, uh, of uh, West Friesland, Dijk, Hout. A lot of the same uh, suffixes, and there is something known as toponymy, and it's the study of place names. And you have this all around the world. You have it in German. You have it in England. You have it in France. You have it. Sometimes a, a it's not a coincidence that many place names have the same suffixes or prefixes. And in West Friesland, Broek, Grote Broek, Lutje Broek, Wout, Wout, West Wout, Nibbixwout, etc., Dijk, Horn, they point towards a wetland area where people needed to protect themselves from both salt water and sweet water. Broek, and Wout are suffixes. Brook means marsh. Wout, of course, means forest, but not just any forest, a wetland forest, a fenland forest. Other forests in the Netherlands, for example, 
in uh, high the Netherlands, that is not a, um, uh, a swamp forest, is known as Lo. Think of Almelo, Hengelo, Sipquilo. All these Paleis at Lo is, is, is the palace in Apeldoorn in the forest. Okay, these are that's a different type of forest. Anyway, all of these suffixes they point toward a wetland area where people needed to protect themselves from both saltwater dike horn. A, a horn is a place on the dike that has a sharp twist to it. So horn over here. Here goes the dike. Sharp twist. Sharp twist over here as well. Duitchen horn, Dirks horn. Those were those were um, swamp dikes built in on the island. Okay, so wetland area where people needed to protect themselves from water. Now, if you have a look at patterns of habituation in West Friesland, you'll notice something. There's different types of patterns of habituation. There's the linear settlement where all the settlements are on lines, as we've seen uh, in uh, 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 reclamation bases, for example. There's planned. Settlements where one area it has more functions and little villages around that one are planned And if you need to go to the university you go over here. This is the crystal theory If you're interested in what that is you can google it yourself. There is no pattern at all There's ra just randomness or there's concentrated as we've seen in the turp landscape Well, which pattern of habituation matches the east of West Frisia best? And does that make sense? No, to, uh, sort of have a look at this map, and if you are uh, quick on the draw, you'll you'll notice something. You'll notice that there are a, that there is a clear pattern of habituation, and it's not planned, it's not random, and it's not concentrated either, and it's linear. There's an axis over here with Hoogkarspel, Grotebroek, Bovenkarspel, Enkhuizen. All the way to Zwaag and Blokker. There's one over here from Horen through Hem and Venhuizen. There is one over here from Wochnum, Nibbixwoud, Mitzwoud, Twisk, all the way up to Onderdijk and Werfershof. There used to be one over here, but it's flushed away. Um, and of course, there's Werfershof, Onderdijk. So there, is, there are lines, clear lines in here. As if they used a reclamation base, right? So we have an area that suggests a swampy area. We have patterns of habituation that suggest a swampy area. Okay, yet if I start digging in the soil, this is what I find. I don't find any peat there. I find sea clay. Okay, if I have a look at the altitude map of West Friesland, there are there is a clear difference in natural altitudes over here very very low over there very very low and then a creek ridge and a creek ridge all the way over here all the way tra being traced back here the creek ridge of the Zijpe so this is this is the story of the creek ridge of the Zijpe um, 5,300 years before present, before present, so 3,000 years ago, Berge, Schol, Egmond, the current coastline is over here. All of this was was uh, ocean. It was the North Sea. And there was a, a huge tidal creek all the way over here. Okay? Mudflats, lagoons. And that this one... This is the Zijpe, and it still shows. See, it's higher. Sand, more sand in, in, in the mix over here. And so less consolida consolidation. This has consolidated more. This has consolidated more. Of course, this is the Wieringemeer polder, which didn't exist until 1920 something. 1916? No, after 1916. So 1920 something, they made this. And over here, by the way, there is a um, planned uh, pattern of habituation thanks to Chris Toller. Anyway, so the Zijpe, uh, that was 
uh, th that is what we have now in the in the floor. But where does this pattern of habituation along these reclamation bases come from? Well, in the early Middle Ages, this is what Western Friesland looked Western Frisia looked like, a swamp area. Okay, this is the Wald at Broekbos, the marsh fenland forest. This is what West Frisia was. Okay, West Frisia was colonized from the dunes in the west. The dunes are sand areas, they are high and dry, it's good living. Okay, a hunter-collector society and some agriculture was done in the dunes. The, 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 but the problem with the dunes is that they are infertile and with population rise not all mouths uh, got fed and people moved into the fenlands, you know, to po uh, to, uh, to, uh, to hunt um, the, the birds that were there, like ducks and geese and collect berries, etc, etc, etc. So... Eventually, people, they, they changed Western Frisia from a natural landscape, a peated area, into a cultural landscape, a polder. This is a peat polder. This is Enkhuizen over here, where I live. This is uh, book. This is the streek, in the, the streek weg, in any case. And so you're looking sort of from... Um, uh, the dike, the West Frisian Umring dike, into the polder, and this is what you saw in, you know, 1500. Var polder, everything was done with the scout, with the boat. Anyway, um, these these areas have a lot of water. These areas still have a lot of water, and they pump that stuff out. Okay, here it is in more detail. Drainage channels. Every this is a peat polder. This is everything we've seen before. Nothing new, but. Land consolidation took place in a massive scale because peat was pumped dry and came in contact with air. When peat comes in contact with air, bye-bye peat. It oxidizes. Oxidation is a chemical reaction that you all have seen before. When a nail rusts, you, you make a nail a little bit wet and you lay it out, it becomes rusty. The iron in the nail oxidizes. It has a reaction with oxygen. Okay? And when peat has the reaction with oxygen in the air, 20% of air is oxygen, 21% or so, then peat dries out and dissolves. It is, it is gone. The peat left Vestrisia. So we have the toponymy and the pattern of habituation of a peat landscape because when the, the villages were built, this was a peat landscape. Okay? But then we started pumping to a massive de degree and the peat basically just oxidized and was blown off with the wind and no more peat is left. If I drill, I find clays. So we have the toponymy and the pattern of habituation of a peat landscape. We have the soil type and the polder and relief type of Walcheren, the creek ridge landscape. And the crazy thing is that on these creek ridges, it's actually easier to have tulips and um, um, uh, fruit. This is, this is a, a, uh, a pear acre where I go with my second graders in the regular program to drill for these creek ridges, to let them discover these creek ridges themselves. So, this is, these, these pear acres, um, it's easier to have the fruit on the creek ridges as we've seen in the river landscapes. What's crazy about West Friesland is that it's a hybrid. There's the toponymy and the pattern of habituation of the peat landscape. There's the soil of, a, uh, of Walcher, of the creek ridge and the relief inversion. And on the higher areas, there's going to be fruit. Over here. And potatoes over there. Oper douze ronde. Best potatoes in the world. Possibly. I don't know. I like them. And there's a big flower industry in West Friesland. Enkhuizen is known as the city of seeds. Where you had these, you know, very embarrassing billboards that says, Zij gaat voor zaad. She, she goes for seed. And you saw this, this cheerful little girl going, yay, seed. Which was kind of, I don't know, embarrassing. <laughs> and they, they removed them after, you know, 
people started to make a lot of jokes about, you know, these come crazy girls. Okay. Um, West, West Frisia is very uh, interesting because it is hybrid. It has many elements of many landscapes because it has a unique history where you can see all these layers, uh, you know, the peats, the clays, uh, and all the processes basically, relief inversion, um, peat uh, boulders, uh, etc. And some of them are, are still, still clear to see if you have the eye for it. Okay, that was it for today.